All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Toolbox Tuesday. Today is part two of our two-part housing series that will explore tools, resources for increasing equitable housing access and exploring development trends. So a couple of housekeeping items. So the meeting length is approximately an hour and a half long. This meeting will be recorded. All participant lines will be muted. At the end, there'll be a Q&A session. If you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box um, or raise your hand function. Um, we will log all questions, then voice selection at the end of the presentation. A recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will be available on the SCAG website, as well as email to everyone who's registered um, for this a Toolbox Tuesday session. So our agenda for today, we'll have an overview of SCAG's housing program. Then the Bell Gardens team will present on their general plan housing update and touch a little bit on the local data exchange. This will be followed by a demo of the helper tool by uh, Skaggs Lyle Janicek. And then we will have an overview of development and CEQA streamlining by Chad Beckstrom, who is with um, Ascent Environmental. Um, we'll also have a demonstration of the OPR site check tool by Brianne uh, Masakawa. And um, finally, we'll have Margaret Sahagi and Edith Medina provide an overview of recent uh, CEQA uh, housing legislation. And uh, we'll end today's session with a Q&A. So in terms of SCAG's um, housing program, it's made up of these various components. The first one being the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, or RENA, the Regional Early Action Planning Program, or REAP1, the Regional Early Action Planning Program 2, or REAP 2.0, our housing working group, as well as the RDP that has several housing uh, related uh, tools. So quickly, what is RENA? RENA is a state mandated process to determine existing and projected housing need. Process to determine RENA allocation is conducted by a council of governments such as SCAG every eight years. Um, the re RENA determination for the latest six cycle was just over 1.3 million units for the SCAG region. Um, so what SCAG does is develop a methodology to assign these units equitably to our member jurisdictions. And then these jurisdictions must plan for their arena allocation and their housing elements by ensuring there are enough sites and zoning to accommodate um, their specific arena numbers. So our Regional Early Action Planning Program, or REAP 1.0, was a $47 million uh, grant um, that SCAG received from the state uh, to provide housing and planning process improvements uh, to services in cities and counties in the SCAG region. Um, the funding was distributed to SCAG members in four large buckets that you can see here. Um, they finance a diverse array of projects from ADU guidelines, uh, permit streamlining uh, to BMT reduction strategies, as well as enhanced infrastructure financing districts. Uh, the latest REIT 2.0 grant program is $247 million, and it builds on the success of the previous REIT program by expanding the program focus, um, such as integrating housing and climate goals and allowing for broader planning and implementation investments, including investments in infrastructure that support uh, infill housing development. Um, the broad objectives of the REIT 2.0 program are to accelerate infill development that facilitates housing supply choice as well as affordability, affirmatively furthering fair housing, um, reducing vehicle miles traveled, um, providing local technical assistance resources, and strategically complementing housing and integrating access to better transportation options. And this includes transit as well as multimodal services that will be critical to support VMT reduction in the region. Um, the Housing Working Group is also part of our housing program here at SCAG. It's essentially a forum for a SCAG staff to engage with stakeholders and uh, in the development and implementation of plans and policies that advance the region's mobility, con economy, and sustainability. Um, the meetings are open to the public and they include participation from stakeholders, staff uh, from both the state and regional level, as well as local agencies. 
Um, it also includes participation of nonprofits, local universities, as well as the business community. Um, recent topics that we've covered in the housing working group include housing element and compliance law, uh, conversion of residential, uh, conversion of other to residential toolkit, um, the connection to Connect SoCal, as well as household growth patterns, and uh, numerous uh, topics related to housing legislation updates. I'll now turn it over to uh, my colleague, Lyle. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lyle Janicek. I am a senior regional planner here at SCAG. Uh, I'm going to give you all a brief overview of uh, the housing, uh, the local data exchange process, as well as um, the uh, housing element parcel tool uh, application. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, there we go. Thank you, Jennifer. All righty. So... Here we go. Okay, uh, so to start off, uh, SCAG uh, is one of SCAG's largest and most transformative uh, initiatives to date and a signature element of SCAG's Future Communities Initiative uh, established in 2017. Uh, the regional data platform is a revolutionary system uh, for collaborative data sharing and people, or excuse me, and planning designed to facilitate better planning at all levels, from cities and counties of all sizes up to the region as a whole. The RDP uh, places data and technology in the hands of local jurisdictions to support more robust community planning, uh, to provide resources to help solve many of our common challenges, and align with Connect SoCal's objectives. Uh, so as such, uh, there are three goals of this platform, uh, the first one being uh, to provide access to data, modern tools, and best practices that support stronger planning and information-based decision-making at all levels. Um, the second goal of the RDP is to streamline the exchange of data with jurisdictions and partners across the region while establishing procedures and standards for geospatial data consistencies. Um, and the third is to establish a community of planners, uh, GIS professionals and practitioners to foster collaboration and collective learning, as well as guide the long-term growth and evolution of the regional data platform. Essentially, the goal is uh, to support regionally aware local planning uh, and doing so uh, by using locally informed uh, regional planning to make a much more uh, cohesive and sustainable region. One of those tools that came out of the regional data platform is going to be the housing element parcel tool. Uh, Helper 2.0 has improved visualization capabilities, jurisdictional dashboards of housing statistics, and filtering capabilities based on ADU site dimensions uh, consistent with state law. Uh, this application is based on updated curated versions of parcel level land use data and other data sets which have been available through SCAG's open data portal. It also allows for downloads of tabular and spatial data for external use. Uh, the tool can be used to plan ADU development in areas of opportunity supporting housing element objectives such as affirmatively furthering fair housing, and to review and align regional policy objectives of SCAG's 2020 Regional Transportation Plan Sustainable Community Strategy. Uh, as a shameless plug uh, for SCAG, uh, our draft uh, Regional Transportation Plan, or Connect SoCal 2024, uh, was released a few weeks ago and is available and open for public review uh, and provide feedback by January 14th, I believe. Um, so I'm going to keep on going. These are some of the uh, items that the selected parcel attribute uh, you're able to select uh, as parcel attributes and helper. Uh, anything from existing land use, uh, ADU eligible parcels, um, environmental justice, priority growth, specific plans. Um, there are also uh, selected environmentally sensitive areas um, that could be uh, looked at through uh, the helper tool, which I will demo in just a few minutes. Um, these range from 100-year floodplains to wetlands to uh, protected areas, landslide, hazard zones, etc. cetera. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to give a quick little uh, information of what we can do with the helper tool. Um, so there are uh, nine default 
site screening filters, uh, which you can filter a database off of, and that includes vacant land, potential infill, high opportunity areas, proximity to services like grocery stores, hospitals, etc. Um, you can uh, refine filtering. So uh, of all of those filtering options above, you're able to go in and edit to maybe find something more compatible to what you're looking for. Um, so these are generalized uh, filtering based off our Connect SoCal 2020. Um, but then there's also advanced analysis. So once you go in and start playing with the parcels, uh, you are able to actually export the parcels that you want, and you can export them as a CSV file. You can export them as a, a shape file. So if you wanted to pull them out and then upload them into your ArcGIS desktop, you're able to do so in that process. And then as we've mentioned, uh, this is the version 2.0. Um, there's minor updates to the parcel data, uh, which have improved geometry and minor corrections, uh, updates to ID fields. Uh, we've also added the 2020 census uh, uh, BGIDs, uh, new unique identifiers. Uh, we also have jurisdiction infographics, uh, snapshots, map, map layers, uh, layer file download options, as well as an ADU information. Um, so the uh, helper tool uh, can be uh, found at uh, maps.skag.ca.gov backslash helper, um, or even a simple SCAG helper tool uh, will probably lead you uh, to the uh, site uh, for your use. So let me give you all a quick demonstration. Uh, and David, can you give me a thumbs up if you can still see uh, my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so when you get to the helper tool, um, it's going to give you a splash screen. Uh, it gives you use limitations uh, and other background information about the helper tool. Um, for time's sake, I'm going to just go through this. So um, as you can see, uh, you're able to filter on the left side uh, panel. Uh, those are some of the nine filters that we discussed uh, briefly just a few minutes ago. Um, and then at the top is where you would select a jurisdiction. So that being either a city or an unincorporated county within the Skag region. Um, as you can see down here at the bottom left of the panel, there are over 5 million rec records in this database. Um, and that will change based on what kind of filtering you have. Um, so if you did want to say download all 5 million records for the entire Skag region, you can do so from this panel by clicking download shape files or download the CSV. Um, and also you can download our layer file down here, uh, which helps you graphically see uh, what the parcels are coded as. Uh, on the top right, we have the documentation. So this will lead you to all of the documentation uh, behind all of these different fields and factors. Um, we have a help button, which is right there. And if you click that, uh, it'll ask you what kind of technical assistance you might need for this kind of uh, review. Uh, we have uh, an app switcher, so there are other SCAG apps based uh, in the RDP. Um, if you click on that, uh, it'll take you to any of, it'll take you to the regional data platform homepage or some of our other apps that we've developed. And then on the right side, we have a search tool, uh, a base map switcher. If you want to switch the base map, um, it'll show you the map layers, um, the legend, as well as a map capture. So if you wanted to take a screen grab, you can do so directly from the app itself. So let me just give you a quick demonstration of what all can be uh, captured in this kind of a, a tool. So I'm going to search um, Pasadena, for example. Uh, once you select the city, it's going to zoom in uh, to that city. So this is Pasadena's land use codes. Uh, this is their land use codes in the regional land use code, de code designation. Um, if you zoom into a parcel, for example, let's do uh, this red one right here next to North uh, Los Robles Avenue. You can select it, and it's going to give you a handful of information, including the acreage, where it's located, if there's any slope information. Um, we have the 2019 existing land use, which is SCAG's land use designation. But we also have all of this information in the uh, local uh jurisdictions land use designation. So this one, pardon me, um, is going to be uh, the jurisdiction zoning code is CD2. So that's going to be Pasadena's zoning code. Um, it'll tell you more about the data set year, all of this other different uh, information um, that you can also understand by filtering. So let's zoom back out just a little bit. 
So say uh, you are wanting to look at, you know, say vacant parcels uh, within the city of Pasadena that also are in alignment with, you know, um, some of SCAG's priorities. So what you could do is you can use these tools to filter out those areas. So say you wanted to filter and look at vacant parcels of appropriate size within the city. Um, you can press that filtering tool. So as you can see, we went from 39,000 um, parcels to roughly 164 parcels. Um, if you look at this little eye, uh, it's gonna give you more information about what is the standard information. Um, and so basically this is filtering uh, the city's parcels of vacant sites, which are between 0.5 and 10 acres. Um, and this is uh, based on a lot of descriptions uh, from HCD's uh, codes. Um, if you go back, and like I said, this is just our standardized way of uh, filtering. You can come in here and you can say, we want to change that to maybe a quarter of an acre to 10 acres or bump it all the way up to 20 acres. You press enter. Um, and as you can see, I think we were at 137 parcels. Now we're up to 339. Um, there are other ways to filter, um, including uh, inside priority growth areas, which are areas that um, already have kind of a predetermined um, a, a great area to grow, uh, whether that be closer to transit, um, whether that's in a neighborhood mobility area. And then we also have outside constrained areas. So these are areas that are not, you know, risk to flooding or uh, other environmentally constrained uh, components of it. So if you turn on that filter, that's going to change and show you that these are the areas uh, that are uh, great spaces to grow um, if you are trying to uh, help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the great thing about the tool is you can also have multiple filters on at once. So based on SCAG's priorities, and then if you wanted to look at, say, what are the vacant parcels look like in that, you can see 91 parcels right here, and you can explore those parcels further. Um, but there are several other options to filter, you know, like I said, opportunity areas. Um, these uh, are based off of the state's um, uh, opportunity uh, scores, such as highest resource, higher resource. Um, you can look at close to proximity and services, uh, which is uh, grocery stores within one mile, healthcare facilities within one mile, um, or even open space uh, within one mile. So if you turn that one on, you can start to see uh, uh, what parcels uh, fall under those three criteria. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues at the city of Bell Gardens to talk more about how they've used the RDP, uh, local data exchange, and also um, the uh, different tools that the city has used to accommodate their uh, housing elements. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Mona Mosayev, Associate Planner with the City of Bell Gardens. I will be starting our presentation. Uh, let me jump right into it. There we go. The launching pad towards a successful planning endeavor is understanding the population that is being served and the existing resources available to, to the city. As noted on the SCAG housing statistics page, the city of Bell Gardens is about 2.6 square miles, approximately 15,787 acres, of which over 730 acres are designated as residential. There's an estimated population of 39,501 people as of 2020. Of this population, the median income is about $50,300 a year whereas Los Angeles median is around 76,000. And these residents rent their homes to the tune of 77% of the housing stock, which leads us to that based on this information, based on the size and need of Bell Gardens, the regional housing needs allocation determined that 503 units were needed. Of this, 100 towards very low income, 29 towards low income, 72 towards moderate income, and 302 of above moderate income. The housing element update informs the staff of the goals and the path ahead. 
for the City of Bell Gardens, this includes fostering housing development, as well as updating the land use and zoning maps to reflect the goals and policies in the housing elements. With that, I will transfer the discussion over to the progresses that have been made towards these goals and policies. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adrian Flores. I'm the Associate Planner here at the City of Bell Gardens, and I will be going over uh, the housing element update progress. So in the City of Bell Gardens, our housing element update was certified by HCD on August 18th of 2022. Um, and our housing element update contains a total of 17 programs. Uh, these programs are related to uh, facilitating housing, ranging from zoning code amendments and to community engagement tactics. Uh, the city is continuously facilitating various programs and working towards completing others. Uh, however, thus far, the city has been able to achieve a few of the programs. So starting off with program six, uh, the city has been able to achieve this program and identify adequate site for lower income arena uh, by adopting ordinance 929, our general plan, land use and zoning consistency, which essentially uh, rezoned approximately 811 parcels to mixed use um, and high density residentials to facilitate housing and meet RENA numbers. Additionally, the rezoning increased adequate sites for lower income RENA numbers. As well for under program six, uh, city also adopted ordinance 938, uh, which is the expansion of allowable exceptions to minimal parking requirements and to alleviate parking standards. Uh, this essentially, uh, the city once prohibited compact parking spaces, uh, but now permits compact spaces as a concession for affordable housing projects to contribute to obtaining adequate sites for low income unit numbers. In addition, this ordinance promoted the use of electric vehicle parking um, and bicycle parking spaces uh, by including associated parking standards for each of those uses. Uh, developers now have the opportunity to substitute vehicle parking spaces with the bicycle parking spaces, um, which would promote the use of other forms of transportation. The city also was able to achieve program 11 under accessory dwelling units. Uh, doing so, we adopted ordinance 919 accessory dwelling units, which provided further standards for accessory dwelling units from what the state allows. The city is seeing an influx of ADU applications and having adopted development standards allow us to streamline plan reviews while complying with state regulations. Furthermore, the city has uh, been able to achieve program 13 development standards by adopting ordinance 938, uh, which I just previously mentioned. Now under 938, uh, we alleviated parking standards by removing the requirement for parking garages and expanding the requirement for covered parking spaces. So requiring garages can hinder development um, of additional housing units and, and the constructing garages can add additional costs to developers. So we are providing them with additional um, opportunities for covered parking spaces rather than requiring only garages. Uh, under program 16, place-based neighborhood improvements, uh, the city adopted ordinance 931, art and public places, and this was to create a program to fund and or facilitate artwork projects by improving by imposing a fee on certain de new development projects. The Art and Public Places program is intended to beautify the neighborhood and expand the opportunities for residents and visitors to experience artistic, historic, and cultural aspects of the city through the placement of artwork. Lastly, uh, the city has been able to achieve program 17, consideration of a rent control ordinance. Now, initially the ordinance was identified as rent control. However, it was then updated to be identified as rent stabilization. Um, this was to clarify the main intent of the ordinance, which is to stabilize rent increases. The city adopted the ordinance to provide residential and rental tenants with the security and protection of their rental status by establishing rent increase caps and equitable eviction procedures. Uh, the ordinance also was put into place to reduce displacement of tenants and the number of complaints and unlawful evictions as reported by the Fair Housing Service Provider. Now, as I previously mentioned, other programs identified in our housing element are currently under are ongoing and will, will not achieve a completion date because they're continuously going, and while others are on our dashboard to complete to further facilitate housing development in our city. 
Now I will go ahead and pass it over to our city planner, Stephen Jones, to go over the uh, LDX participation. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, Mona. The clarification I want to make before I start is just that the two and a half mile wide city is about 1,500 to 1,600 acres and not 15,000, but Adrian and Mona were doing some great work before I got here, and it's a great reflection on the city, so the housing element was basically done when I arrived, and uh, I'll start with LDX participation. So just shortly around that time when I got here, the web mapping tool developed by SCAG that Lyle spoke of before was instrumental in developing a certified housing element and helping to confirm the direction our consultants were positioned to take and help us verify sources to help our stakeholders as well understand land use, site opportunities, and environmental sensitivities for aligning with the State Department of Housing and Community Development's sixth cycle housing element requirements. Say that 10 times fast. So the digital presence of the city was minimal or is still minimal in, in many cases. And so the city has the uh, small capacity and presence of uh, what most small cities would have. So we maximize our leverage by providing the information to the greater region through sites like the LDX, even though the back end is really for us and we're putting in information and it's really for a tool for uh, the industry or the governmental services, uh, providing that uh, connection to prospective developers and owners has been a godsend for helping us meet regional goals for access to services and other data points, which also makes us eligible for funding to accomplish goals and foster agreement among other municipalities and other agencies like Metro and helping us increase regional uh, resiliency and sustainability. The SCAG software provides a digital presence for the city to show land use and zoning and streamline the provision of information helpful to facilitate housing production. And there's also a housing balance uh, with jobs and services for commercial endeavors. We confirmed housing element data to include the adequate sites, inventory, and ongoing general plan and zoning consistency endeavors to ensure effective implementation. And so Adrian went over just a few of the programs, and we've got a ways to go, but we've uh, had some, I would say, good success in the last year uh, for implementing the housing element. So the tool is used as a go-to, and it's helpful with digital currency as well. So it increases our credibility in terms of uh, meeting with the community and actually dealing with developers and, and savvy mom and pops and, and folks of, of, of means to help get them to develop their property. 86% of our constituents get their civic information from social media or our website. And with that being their first stop, it's important for us to have uh, current, reliable, and timely information and consumables there. And again, up until just very recently, we really had no uh, capability, no GIS presence. Uh, we were using, I see the County of Los Angeles online, we were using uh, a lot of your resources and others. And so SCAG has uh, given us a little bit of uh, validity there instead of sneaking around using other people's GIS. Uh, we also have consistent markability now. The city has won a number of grants. Well, we have a grant writer. Uh, there is a fee associated with those, and sometimes we can avoid that fee with less complicated applications that take fewer staff hours because of the tool. Uh, this past month, we won grants to develop a climate action plan, where along with the Cal Enviro screen, we were able to identify components that comprise most, if not all, of Bell Gardens as a disadvantaged community based on income and other demographics. Uh, we're also developing our first specific plan, transit-oriented community. And we got a grant to do that for bringing density to transit corridors and to increase transit ridership, reduce over-reliance on vehicles, increase air quality through reduced GHGs and VMTs. And that's because of EBA planning's help, uh, which we got with the free grant writing service from LA County Metro. That all began with us using the information that we get from LDX, from other sources, putting that information to good use in terms of a, a successful application to be eligible uh, for help because we sorely need that. And additionally, the tool provided us the opportunity to include certain regional policy objectives from SCAG's 2020 Regional Transportation Plan and Sustainable Community Strategy. And that was meaningful to Metro in the context of transportation and how this city as one of the entrances to the Gateway City's Council of Governments area played a role in the entire region. 
and I know I'm coming up on time here, so I'm going to try to go really quickly through this highlighted success. Uh, we used this site as a an example, but it was prior to us actually using the tool, but it's being helpful now. So it's worth it to say that um, the former Burke Oil Brownfield site located on Shoal Street in the city is a site that could be considered a success story for comprehensive information provided by the tools. The background is the Burke Oil Brownfield consists of seven contiguous parcels now vacant directly adjacent to the 710 freeway. 4.33 acres located in a mixed industrial and residential neighborhood. This has evolved over time through various owners and uses, had been used as a manufacturer cardboard forms facility, gasoline tanks, a plastic and metal fabrication plant, and an asphalt mixing and oil distribution facility. So lots of uses. Uh, it seemed like maybe that's going to be good for nothing but industrial. But the Community Development Commission purchased the site in May 1985 to remove blight and return it to beneficial use. And it's still vacant, it's still been since then. Uh, Bell Gardens originally purchased the Burke Oil portion of the site in, for, for 595,000. And the remainder of the site was acquired in 1992 during the escrow purchase, excuse me, during the escrow for purchase of the Burke Oil site, the city hired associates to assess contamination levels. And it was estimated that $21,000 would be needed to clean it up. Well, let's just cut to 2023. Uh, we'll cut to 2022. We've received or needed 6.5 million to clean it up. So I don't know if that's inflation or just uh, we found more stuff. We actually did find a lot more contamination than what was originally estimated. But again, having this tool to sort of look at what uh, the context is, we're able to market sites like this and make sure that you know the surplus land act is helped by us um, using tools to deploy the best information so again cut to 2023 we're able to say we're expecting breaking ground next year on a 100 unit affordable completely affordable project for 18 for sale units and 82 rental units so i again attribute uh, obviously the good work of the folks here and the Regional Water Quality Board and ETSC and all the folks that put uh, in to help us with the Equitable Community Revitalization Grant, but $6.5 million later, and we're still going to need a little more. So using the tools to uh, get us the right combination of information to DTSC and getting that second round of money is going to be very helpful to us completing it. But um, after all these years, we're finally getting some headway, and it's part of us getting uh, information from the helper tool and the LDX information. So I was going to talk about everything in terms of money, and uh, yeah, we're just going to go through that. 1985, $595,000. Today, I looked at a site. I looked at Zillow, I think, and it's like uh, you're going to maybe spend $17 million for a site of similar size and proportion. So again, I guess you adjust for inflation and you find that's where $21,000 for cleanup became $6.5 million. Uh, environmental, excuse me, economic development implications. So we also look at the tool for, again, just advertising and marketability. We're able to use this tool as a way to let folks know on our economic development side, because we're not just planning here. We're a small city, so we're looking at economic development as well. If anybody knows of a restaurant, we want to sit down restaurant across from our Applebee's. Call me. So the economic ind development indicators include um, ranges from major to neighborhood level opportunities for all levels of marketability and incorporation from mixed use to heavy retail. So these are sites that we look at in terms of you know what types of uh, use are we looking for from an economic development standpoint, but also what does someone want to bring to the community? And that's more economic development implications and then environmental justice implications as well. We're looking at developing a, a environmental justice element. This year, we should be going to our planning commission in December with the first draft. And that's because of, again, us being able to win grants with consolidated information that's comprehensive and understandable. Impact Sciences, our consultant who won an award for their environmental justice element in Bell is working with us to develop that. And then finally, I'll just say the comprehensive information is also uh, good for context. So, so far, again, I talked about our digital presence, 
basically we had our PDF of our zoning map and people had to take it or leave it. And, and it really didn't provide a lot of context here. We can say, Hey, go to Skag's website and we can show you how to do that. You have the information there with context to uh, other regions and other jurisdictions. So that's very helpful for us in terms of uh, what we look like in the larger context for goals for regional sustainability. Our next steps would be we want to um, help improve the tool. So it's good. And we want to make sure that uh, there's a status dashboard so that we can know when we put items in how that's being used. We know that the information comes out of the back end and that people are using it, but it would be helpful to know when we put it in, when to expect it. For example, we put in our 2023 updates and we're still waiting on getting that information actually out of the system. Very helpful to to know that it's in there and I guess some some uh, work we're doing with Tom and his team to make sure that things are improved. So I guess you guys can stand by for the next versions and iterations of that. Uh, with that being said, I apologize for taking so long and um, that's it. You have our contact information. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that presentation. Um, just a reminder, we'll be taking questions at the end. Um, so moving on, now we have Chad Beckstrom from Ascent Environmental. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Chad Beckstrom, um, the Southern California Environmental Practice Leader for Ascent. And uh, I've been managing the development streamlining efforts on behalf of SCAG here. So I'm gonna be providing an overview of the project here today and share some of the resources that we put together and before that, I just want to make sure I also acknowledge our partners um, at Civic Solutions, as well as the Hagi Law Group. So Edith and, and Margaret are on. Um, we'll be talking a little bit later as well. Okay, so as uh, you know, as we all know, the state's been facing a severe housing shortage with um, with really an emphasis on affordable housing. The legislature has passed several bills over the years to really facilitate housing production and incentivize uh, certain types of housing. But you know there are, are still a number of things that get in the way, starting with a lack of understanding of what can often be confusing, complicated, and onerous criteria and procedures. And uh, SCAG really wanted to do its part to help its member agencies to uh, to expedite housing entitlements and increase new housing production in the region. So this project really focused on two ways to approach uh, streamlining of, of development. The first one being to better use the CEQA streamlining tools that offer exemptions and streamline analysis. And the second is to um, streamline the administrative processes to expedite reviews. And the aim was really to provide resources and education to cities, counties, developers, other land use professionals who might uh, benefit from this. So we kicked off the project about two years ago in the fall of 2021. We started with a survey of SCAG's member agencies. We, um, we really wanted to kind of understand the current challenges planners were facing with respect to development streamlining. We also wanted to understand their familiar, familiarity with you know, some of the existing tools available and whether they had specific tools that they were using or that they found most helpful. So um, the question is really kind of centered around demographic information, familiarity with the existing streamlining or exemption tools, knowledge of state laws, and um, what were the barriers to, to using the streamlining? So those responses um, were, were then used to influence the content and the format of the products and materials that, that were to come. So we ended up preparing 14 uh, separate short bulletins and published them on SCAG's website um, where there's a page dedicated to development streamlining here. There were uh, eight devoted to CEQA streamlining, six to the administrative processes. These were non-binding advisory in nature. We really aimed to make these user-friendly so that planners could quickly get information they needed to figure out how to implement the various tools and strategies. So just to highlight a few of these, the, um, the administrative process materials cover subjects like the Housing Crisis Act, SB 330 and SB 8. They would cover AB 2345 on density bonus law, including uh, waivers, incentives and concessions, SB 9 and 10 to cover administrative approval of duplexes and urban lot splits and local rezoning uh, for missing in the middle housing production. We have one on SB 35 for ministerial approval of affordable housing projects. And so planners can really you know, use, utilize this guidance to, to learn about the laws, 
um, when it was passed, the purpose, the government code citations to identify which types of projects qualify um, for, for the various streamlining, to understand the, the processes that are involved. In, and we include some flow charts, which I'll, I'll show you here as well. Um, we also have links to additional resources, uh, as well as some, some checklists that you, uh, that you as a user can use to see if your project qualifies. The CEQA streamlining materials cover topics like you know, how to use categorical exemptions, particularly class 32 for, for infill development. Um, we cover exemptions for residential or mixed use housing in unincorporated areas. Um, we cover exemptions for residential and certain mixed use projects that are consistent with a specific plan, for instance. Uh, we cover streamlining for infill projects, you know, involving tiering from previous EIRs, which can really help limit the SQL review for projects that can meet certain performance standards and that are consistent with, uh, with SCAG's sustainable community strategy. Um, we also provide some information on streamlining for projects that are consistent with the general plan or zoning. So using one five, section 15183 of the SQL guidelines, for instance, you could tier, you may be able to tear off your general plan or your zoning uh, EIR for, for certain projects that are consistent with that. And then we cover things like SB 375 and SB 743 on the sustainable communities exemptions and the various streamlining options there. So again, you can use these to, um, to learn about the exemptions and tiering strategies to identify which projects qualify, <clears throat> to understand kind of the decision process and how that works. And again, we provide more resources, checklists and things like that to, to help you along the way. We also include a, a couple of matrices. Um, these are kind of at a glance types of tools, which will help you compare and contrast different streamlining options. So one is devoted to the various exemptions and another one was used to, um, to talk about how you might streamline and which, um, or rather tier from existing environmental documents and, and how to go about do that, doing that with advantages, disadvantages and, and benefits to each there. And um, I just want to quickly show you that the materials are not just a bunch of text here, but also include useful flowcharts, process guidance to help you through the process and help you to come to um, the decision you need to make. And then again, we have some worksheets that identify the different requirements, um, the applicability of your project, whether your project can meet the requirements. Um, and, and this type of resource can also help you uh, as an agency to provide the substantial evidence you may need to support the use of a CEQA exemption. And then just a quick plug for, for the site check tool, Brianne is gonna talk about this in more detail, but this tool can really be used to help identify which of those streamlining options we talked about um, that your particular project may, may qualify for, qualify for or, um, particularly uh, maybe help take some of the, the work out of it for you. And then finally, we, um, we had a series of Zoom webinars that cover the materials and provide details about these uh, various administrative processes and CEQA streamlining. We, we cover all the materials I shared with you, but um, we grouped these together in, in four different sessions here. So these, uh, these were recorded and links are provided on SCAG's website. So you can, you can go here to watch the recordings. You can find the PowerPoint presentations if you missed them or would like a refresher. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so moving on to our next presenter, Brianne. Hi, everyone. My name is Brianne Masakawa. I uh, am a planner here at the Office of Planning and Research and also the project lead for SiteCheck. So, um, so, uh, I'll be uh, performing a quick overview of the tool itself and performing a few walkthroughs. So, uh, but before I get to those, I'll give a quick introduction and purpose of the tool and then the walkthroughs that I mentioned and then conclude with some next steps. So overall, SciCheck is a free and public mapping tool, as Chad mentioned, that allows anyone to be able to quickly identify a parcel where a housing projects may qualify, especially if you're looking for a housing project, qualify for streamlining uh, and exemptions under the CEQA Act. Um, this was funded as part of technical assistance for SB2, and we are working with the Conservation Biology Institute, or CBI, to develop and also maintain the tool. 
So uh, the purpose of the tool, well, right now we are dealing with a housing crisis, unfortunately. And so the idea is that this tool is to help uh, planners be able to find where uh, existing streamlining options may apply quickly. And so this tool is really intended to be a first step in the process and not the final step. Uh, just as a reminder that this tool cannot be used to determine that a project is exempt from CEQA. Again, it is a first step and, and intended to be a helpful starting point. And, uh, and this will be made very clear as we get through the walkthroughs. Okay, so I'm going to put a quick link in the chat uh, for those, excuse me. Um, Stop sharing my screen for a second. Oh, there, there it is. Never mind. There it is. So um, you can follow along with um, at the link that I provided in the chat. Uh, this section will be uh, done with a series of screenshots. So. Um, once you open that link, you'll find a disclaimer window. Uh, this just uh, states that this is an informational tool. And so once you've read uh, the conditions, uh, then you would click I accept, and then it'll open to, into the tool itself. So on the right side, you'll find an interactive map. Uh, and then on the left side, you'll find the navigation panel that has four tabs. It's overview, explore, screen, and analyze. In the overview tab, you'll find the description for SciCheck as well as um, uh, instructions for how to use each tab and other key features. The Explore tab is quite useful in that you can uh, use a whole host of data sets and that can be turned on and off to better understand an area where you may build a potential project. The uh, data sets that are available uh, cover parcels, boundaries and jurisdictions, urbanized urban areas, specific plan areas, transit, VNT, and a whole host of environmental constraints. Another good thing to note is that uh, within this tab is where uh, you can find links to where to download many of the layers used in this tool. So you'll find a blue icon next to each layer and it'll take you to where it can be downloaded on database which is a public and free mapping and analysis platform. Uh, in order to access uh, the download links, however, you will need to create an account, but again, it's free of charge, okay? And just another thing to note is that several of the layers within the Explore tab have transparency functions, so you'll be able to adjust to make it easier. Uh, to uh, uh, turn layers on and off and be able to see them as you pile them onto each other, okay? And so I'm gonna move on to the screen tab now. The screen tab is very useful in that you can actually filter out parcels based on a specific set of criteria that you may have. So um, many of the layers that are within this tab are almost identical to those in the Explore tab. The only difference um, are the transit layers. In the Explore tab, they focus on the location of existing transit, whereas in the Screen tab, it focuses on proximity to existing transit. So you'll see here, it'll be half mile of an existing major transit stop or maybe half a, mi um, half a mile from an existing high quality transit corridor. Okay. So um, let, um, let's say, I'm an affordable housing developer seeking to build in Fresno. So if I was using this tab, I would go to the search box in the upper right-hand corner, type in Fresno, and it would actually zoom into this view. Now, I already know a few things that I want for my potential project. And so one, I know I want it within city boundaries. So I turn on within a city and you can see how many parcels get filtered out. I also know that I want this to be within a specific plan boundary. So I turn on the covered by a specific plan. I also know that I want this to be within reasonable distance of uh, of existing transit. So I turn on 
the half mile of an existing major transit stop. Now, you can see how much has been filtered out, so I'm going to zoom into what remains. And so this is the view I get. So I see there's quite a few parcels left. So I also want to explore how many parcels are within the 15% below regional average for VMT in this area. So I turn the per capita VMT 15% below regional average layer and uh, see more parcels been filtered out. And then I also want to avoid certain environmental constraints. So for this example, I turn on earthquake seismic hazard zone, nothing is removed, the landslide, ha landslide hazard, floodplain, it looks like some have been removed there, and then wildfire hazard. So uh, that's how screen function works. I'm gonna move on to the analyze tab now. For this, this is the tab where it will actually produce a report that states which CEQA exemptions or streamlining options are available for a parcel. So for this, typically you would want to have a location in mind uh, when using this function, but there's uh, other ways you can do that, like zooming into a location and picking a parcel from there. So it works that way as well. But for this next example, I already have a location in mind, which is in Glendale, and I have an address already. And so when I type that in, it should zoom into that location and a little pop-up window will appear like this, uh, like this screenshot here. And so what happens is that in order to get the report, I actually have to click the word select that appears in the pop-up window. It'll populate the create projects panel on the left side of the screen. And so um, for this project as well, I decide that I don't only want one parcel, I want to develop multiple parcels. So I can select one of the three select from map options to uh, select more parcels. And so again, I'll populate the create projects panel and uh, in order for this uh, tool, at least for this function to work and process all these parcels as one project, you actually have to click on are the parcels um, that will be included in the project, consolidate them by clicking the green add project button to consolidate them into one. And so once that's done, then you can click the blue button in the lower left-hand corner called create report. And a pop-up window appears and this will have a legal disclaimer legend and then three sections which are labeled statutory exemptions, categorical exemptions, and streamlining. I want to make it very clear this is not an exhaustive list of everything that is available. However, these were selected by our SQL uh, team as the most commonly used and most applicable to as many situations in California. So um, what you'll also find are three icons that'll show up throughout the report. You'll see a blue check mark uh, for a provision if a spatial requirement was met. You'll find a green question mark if um, if there were spatial requirements that were met. However, it requires further verification by a user, or there were other requirements that weren't based um, that uh, by that can't be determined by the spatial layers in the tool and again, require more verification by the user. X is fairly straightforward. If there was a spatial requirement and it was not met, then the red X appears, okay? So uh, just to show how this works, when you go down or, or scroll through the uh, report, you'll see, um, you might see the icon next to a an exemption or provision. So. Here you'll see the green question mark for an exemption uh, related to specific plans. You'll see that we have uh, we have text stating that there is data stating that this relates to a specific plan in Glendale. However, this will require further verification. And then it's followed by a checklist of other remaining requirements that again, need more verification by a user. And this structure 
it um, continues throughout the entire report. So for example, this is another uh, provision that, and this one's related to SB 375, the same structure where it goes, okay, this is a requirement. And in this case, there was a spatial requirement that was clearly met. So in this case, within an MPO, and then the blue check mark appears. And then again, it's followed by a checklist. Okay, so if you want to download the report um, at the top uh, right hand corner, there's a download button that actually provides two PDF export options. There's a blue check mark only option and then a blue check mark and green question mark only option. Highly recommended to only download the first option as it's a much shorter report. And the PDF export should look something like this. It'll have the title, site check report, date it was generated, the legal disclaimer, the legend, and then the three sections we just went over. And the nice thing is that it'll be an expanded view, so it'll be very easy to review as you can see here, okay? And then uh, at the very end of the report, you'll find a section called other resources. And these are actually other um, exemptions or streamlining provisions that tend to be more specific. And this really serves to be a reminder for other options that might apply. So again, these are very specific. So you'll see ones in here like agricultural employee housing or converting uh, motels into supportive housing. So to, just to give you an idea. Okay. So you'll actually be able to find that documentation available in the other resources tab located in the upper right hand corner of the tool itself. And if you're curious about tool design and development, data analysis, data sets, or uh, possibly all the inputs that were put into the tool, as well as the GIS methodology used for each layer in the tool. We actually have that available in the methods section that uh, can be accessed in the overview tab and also in the upper right hand corner as well. Another good feature to note is the create link function. This actually can be accessed in the overview tab as well as the upper right hand corner as well. Let's say you have a project and you have a certain view and you've already generated reports and you want to keep this work that you've done. The tool can't save this within the tool itself. However, the create link, link function allows you to automatically generate a link that you can copy and paste for your own records and then also be able to share with others and it'll reproduce the uh, view that you had on your own screen. So very useful, okay. So I'm actually going to perform a live walkthrough now and I'm going to uh, evaluate potential sites within Bell Gardens as an affordable housing developer. So I'm going to change my view to Excuse me, just give me a second. Uh, so uh, and when I open the tool again itself, I have a disclaimer button. I click I, I accept. And uh, it takes me to the tool itself. I am already familiar with this tool, so I'm just going to jump right into it. I know I want to look, evaluate Bell Gardens. So I go into this window here and it zooms into about gardens. Also, uh, if there's any te technical difficulties, uh, I apologize, my computer is a little slow this morning, uh, afternoon. Okay, so now I've zoomed into Bell Gardens itself. I'm gonna go into the Explore tab and I want to make it easier for myself to be able to tell which parcels are within Bell Gardens. So I'm going to turn on the city boundary. And then I also want to know what other existing features are within um, Bell Gardens based on what's available here. 
So I'm curious to know if there are any uh, specific plan areas within the uh, within the city, and you'll see there are none. I want to know what the transit uh, options are here. So I turn on existing transit op major transit stops, the existing high quality transit corridors, and then also stops along existing high quality transit corridors. I also want to know if there is um, anything will appear when I turn on the per capita VMT, VMT um, 15% below regional average layer. And it looks like there are three areas. And I also want to make sure I avoid environmental constraints. So I'll be turning on all of these. So it looks like we have some special habitats. We, there are no prime farmland. No, uh, there are some wetlands. Yes, there are some wetlands. No earthquake, seismic hazard zones. It looks like there is a statewide, let's see, a state conservancy boundary for the entire city. I want to turn that off for now. Riparian areas, there are none. Some landslide area, hazard areas, but it looks like it's mostly outside the city. Floodplains, again, mostly outside the city. And then no wildfire hazards that appear here. So I'm going to minimize the legend here. So that's how this, uh, I would uh, use Explore. And then also for screen, now that I have a better idea of what's within uh, City of Bell Gardens, um, let's see, I'm going to see, I'm going to focus in on parcels that are within pro close proximity for transit for this situation. So I know that I would like I'm uh, to have parcels as close to the high quality transit corridor that I see running through the center of the city. So I'm going to turn that on. And can I see quite a few parcels have been removed. I also would ideally like only parcels to show that appear in one of the pink areas that appear on the screen. So I'm going to turn the per, per capita VMT 15% below regional average layer. So that already uh, removes more. So now, the, um, in this scenario, this is when I typically would evaluate and zoom into what's available. So I'm going to zoom into this area here. And just to take note of like the transparency function that I mentioned earlier, this pink is a little bright. So I can go back to explore, and I can go to this layer and then change the transparency so it's not as vivid. Okay. And so uh, this is when I would go to the analyze function because I can already tell based on the parcels that I see here, I can click on a parcel, the one that I'm interested in, click select and it populates the create projects panel. But then I realize I also wanna do another uh, parcel as well. So when I use this feature called box, select two at the same time and again populates the create projects panel again i'm going to consolidate the two parcels click the add project and it makes it one project and so now i'm going to generate the report and the pop-up window that i mentioned earlier again it appears here and it's exactly the same structure you know statutory exemptions categorical and then uh, streamlining at the bottom here. And so um, I just want to note though um, that in the report itself, sometimes you'll see uh, you'll see an exemption that doesn't have a symbol next to it. I would just advise making sure to expand the view because the default is this consolidated view. You can click the button, and usually when there is no icon directly next to an exemption, it means that there was a condition that wasn't met. So in this case, the condition that was not met was that it was within a state conservancy area. So I just want to highlight that when you're going over the report. Okay. So again, uh, now that uh, this pop-up window is up, I now want to download the PDF for this. So I go here. I click the check mark only option, and then 
it should generate this report. Okay, so that's how it works in real time. And so um, right now, the next steps for the tool itself, really, um, we are in the middle of updating existing layers that you see there. And we are working on adding more contextual layers into the tool itself. Uh, we are also uh, searching for other opportunities to incorporate the tool um, to help planners clarify and streamline other processes related to housing as well. So um, that concludes my presentation. I thank everyone for their time and uh, I'll uh, help answer any questions in the chat. Thank you so much, Brianne. Um, so moving on to our next presentation, which is going to be an overview of recent CEQA and housing legislation, and this will be presented by Dr. Edith Medina, as well as Margaret Sahagi. Thank you, David. We're going to talk here for a minute about where the Housing Accountability Act meets CEQA. Um, AB 1633 uh, is an impactful new piece of legislation. I, if you read one piece of new legislation from this last session, I would choose this one for you. It expands the Housing Accountability Act by linking CEQA to it. But think about this, the Housing Accountability Act is codified in the government code. All of this is within the government code. It does not touch CEQA, but it addresses CEQA. Interesting to think about the political sausage making that went on there. So what do I mean? An applicant can now allege that a city or county's CEQA determination, the type of CEQA document you're using for CEQA compliance, is in fact a disapproval of an affordable housing development project under the Housing Accountability Act. And when could this happen? It's under two situations. When a local agency fails to determine that an affordable housing project is exempt from CEQA, an applicant can say, no, you did an EIR, this should have been an exemption. Or when your city or county fails to require further study, or adopt a neg deck, an addendum, certify an EIR, um, any of the of the above can now potentially be brought um, as a violation under the Housing Accountability Act. Now, there's there's certain qualifiers to this. It only applies to projects. Um, that are not environmentally sensitive areas, for example, coastal zones, wetlands, high fire zones, and it meet, must meet certain infill requirement. Why did this come about? I understand this came about about what um, from what HCD felt like was some stalling of affordable um, housing, affordable housing project uh, by the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco. Um, but by adding these two criteria to the Housing Accountability Act, um, plaintiffs can utilize the legal remedies in the Housing Accountability Act to sue your city or county um, should they feel that you have delayed or chosen the incorrect CEQA document. The legislation includes lots of time frames and procedures. When, when does the applicant have to notify you as the lead agency that they think you've chosen um, too extensive a document such that you're quote unquote stalling? So I encourage you to look at the various time frames that are set out. If you receive one of these notices from an applicant, then you have a time as a lead agency to respond and explain why you've chosen the correct document. It does also provide that plaintiffs would not be awarded attorney's fees under the Housing Accountability Act if as the local agency, you acted in good faith to disapprove a housing development project due to a question of law. And then, of course, that will be the courts for the courts to decide whether you were disapproving based upon a question of law. So here again, one to pay attention to. Procedural changes to CEQA that are relevant to all your, your housing um, projects. Heads up, 
as of January 1st, you have to file all of your notices of determination with the state clearinghouse as well as the county. So don't forget to do that come January. Then there's SB 149, and this relates to the compilation of an administrative record um, for purposes of CEQA litigation. And you know, really, as many of you probably know, putting together that record creates a lot of time um, and delay in CEQA litigation, hence in getting housing built on the ground. Right now, petitioners have the option to say, we're gonna put together the record. If they elect to do that, you as lead agency can say, no, sorry, we reject your invitation to put together the record. We wanna do it instead, knowing that you can do it faster and likely more effective. And in that case, you've got five business days to tell them that you're going to prepare the record. And here's the big caveat to this. If you decide to go that route, that your agency bears the cost of preparing that record. You can never recover those costs from the party that sued you. Um, so something for you to discuss with your county council or city attorney. Now let's talk about SB 423. This extends SB 35 to the year 2036. So you're gonna be living with the streamlining provision SB 35 um, for another decade plus. And it also expands the reach of SB 35. So remember SB 35 establishes that ministerial streamlined process that affordable developers can use if your jurisdiction has not met its arena numbers. This bill now authorizes SB 35 to apply in the coastal zone beginning in 2025 previously has not. So heads up, as, as of 2025, SB 35 applies in the coastal zone. It also expands SB 35 by subjecting cities and counts, counties to SB 35 streamlining if your jurisdiction does not have a compliant housing element. So that's another criteria that you're going to see listed on um, HCD's SB 35 website. Additionally, it now says that if your jurisdiction does not meet the above moderate household targets, a project that's eligible for SB 35 streamlining must include 10% of its units for very low income households. So here again, an expansion of SB 35. Continuing now to the next slide, AB 356 was codified. So as of January, this just extends until 2029, an existing provision that waives looking at aesthetic effects for projects that refurbish or convert or replace derelict buildings, it just extends um, that slight waiver. And then we have SB 91, continues an existing CEQA statutory exemption for the conversion of motels, hotels, or hostels that support transitional housing. So that statutory exemption stays on the books. Let's talk about AB 1307. You may have caught wind of this battle going on in, as highlighted in all of our newspapers. This was urgency legislation that was in response to a court decision with respect to a student housing project on People's Park at um, University of California in Berkeley. It was emergency legislation that was drafted and passed within 24 hours, an absolute record, I think, for the um, legislature. It clarifies that for residential projects, not just for university projects, but residential projects, the effect of noise generated by project uh, occupants and their guests on human beings is not a significant effect on the environment per sequel. So if you have got a housing project, a student housing project, those students perhaps drink a little bit too much and make a lot of noise off campus, that is not noise that you need to analyze in your CEQA document. 
It does also establish that for institutions of higher education um, proposing a residential or mixed use um, project, they don't need to consider alternative locations. AB 1449 exempts agencies, um, entitlements or leases, conveyances, financial assistance, um, and the such for um, affordable housing projects. And interesting, um, any actions you need to facilitate those, such as a zone change, a specific plan amendment, a general plan amendment, to further the construction of that affordable housing project is now also um, statutorily exempt. It is subject to a lot of qualifiers, which is the case with many of these exemptions now. And uh, SB 406 establishes a new CEQA exemptions for actions that may be taken by your city or county, as, long as, as well as HCD, um, to provide financial assistance for low and moderate income residential housing. So that's a, a quick whirlwind, and Adith is going to continue with the whirlwind. Yes, thank you, Margaret. I'll be going over some housing streamlining bills. So we have SB4, which now allows churches, faith institutions, and nonprofit colleges to build affordable housing under land through a streamlining approval process. And to qualify, SB4 projects require that 100% of the units exclusive of manager units be affordable to lower income households, with some exceptions detailed in the law. And there's also off-street parking um, requirements, except where state law or local ordinances not require it. And all SB4 projects are eligible for density bonus and incentives or concessions and so forth. The next is SB684, which streamlines building permit approvals for homeownership projects of 10 units or less in infill areas. So the project will have to meet a 600 square feet minimum parcel size and density requirements, and they have to be located on a lot zone for multifamily residential development that is no larger than five acres and is surrounded by qualified urban uses. And then there is AB 1490, which makes adaptive reuse of existing buildings to create new residential units for 100% affordable housing projects. And there are several qualifications for AB 1490 streamlining. Um, and some of them are that the project must be residential or commercial building that allows temporary dwelling or occupancy and that all units have to be dedicated to lower income households with at least 50% dedicated to very low income households. Here you see two bills listed that changed the density bonus law. So AB 1287 changed the law to allow additional bonuses for projects that maximize the production of very low, low or moderate um, units as allowed. And so by doing so, then the projects are now eligible for four incentives or concessions, five incentives or concessions for 100% affordable projects near major transit stop. And SB 713 clarifies what development standard um, means. And so by clarifies the law by ex expanding the definition of regulation. And the, this is the last slide with three more bills that change ADU law, AB 1976. Well, so before this bill, you had ADU law saying that it prohibited local agencies from imposing owner occupancy conditions on ADUs up until January 1st, 2025. But now this bill extends the prohibition indefinitely. However, local agencies are still required to impose owner occupancy requirements on junior ADUs. And then we have AB 1033. And so before ADU law used to not allow, you know, the separate cell or conveyances of ADUs from primary dwellings, except for qualified nonprofits. But now AB 1033 authorizes, but did not require local agencies to adopt local ordinances, allowing ADU to be conveyed as condominium separately from the primary dwelling. And then lastly, AB 1332 is now creating a more streamlined approval process for locally 
pre-approved ADU designs. And I know this might be another thing that had on your long to-do list, but this bill now requires the local agencies develop a program for the pre-approved of ADU plans by January 1st, 2025. So once an ADU plan is approved, local agencies then are required to either approve or deny an ADU application that uses pre-approved ADU plan within 30 days. And this also requires jurisdictions to create and maintain a website with the pre-approved ADU plans and contact information of the companies that offer the plans. Okay, so this now concludes our presentation. Thank you, and I'll pass it now to David. Thank you so much. Um, so we have about nine minutes for Q&A. I'll read uh, out the questions in the order that we received them. So I think the first one is related to um, the helper tool. And the question is, how often does the local zoning information get updated? Uh, David, I think this is question Lyle? was already um, answered, but Lyle, please oh. um, add additional information should you want to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom. Um, but uh, yeah, we uh, typically update this uh, as frequently as we possibly can. Uh, our process for updating this information uh, is it coincides with the updates to our regional transportation plan, which happens every four years. Um, and so Right now, uh, we have the 2019 annual land use database. Um, it will be updated uh, within the next year of uh, the finalized draft plan updates. So um, long story short, we met with uh, 191 cities and six counties uh, between May 2022 and December 2022. Uh, we gave them a lot of data and information, including zoning, uh, general plans, specific plans, um, those kinds of information. We had them review it, and then they give it back to us uh, uh, as uh, reviewed data, and then we uh, integrate it into our updated data sets. We also cross-reference it with the uh, assessor's information um, that we uh, work on um, throughout the years. So uh, we try to do it. it. It for sure happens at least every four years, but we're trying to get it uh, to be almost an annual update now. So, Thank you. Um, Lau, we have another question for you. This is related to um, flexible transit routes if they'll be added to the helper tool at some point. Yeah, so the data that is integrated into the helper tool uh, that primarily focuses on transit routes, uh, those are based on the routes that are defined in Connect SoCal. Um, so when we're talking about transit priority areas, high quality transit areas, high quality transit corridors, uh, those uh, are established by our local uh, transportation commissions, as well as reviewed by cities, and then those are eventually approved by our board of regional council members. So those are updated every four years. That coincides with um, the uh, regional transportation plan. Um, but uh, there is a way to overlap. If you have local flexible data, you can overlay that with the data you export out. Uh, to take a better look at maybe some of the localized uh, transit routes that are going on in your communities. Well, thank you. And then lastly, is there a contact or point of contact if uh, jurisdictions have uh, updates to their data? So maybe perhaps like an email you can pop into the chat? Yeah, I'll drop it into the chat. Um, the best way to get a hold of our team is uh, reaching out to list at skag.ca.gov. Um, it's the local information systems uh, team here at SCAG. So I will drop that contact information into the chat. Thank you. Um, and then we have a follow-up question to do with parcels. So what if a city, what does this, what does the city do if there are zero parcels inside priority, priority growth areas outside uh, constraint areas? Great question. Uh, so those uh, filters that you've seen uh, that are integrated into it, you know, the outside constrained areas includes 13 variables. Uh, the inside priority growth areas includes four variables, I believe. Um, and so that changes. Uh, that's what the, the highest amount of it can be. So you can go in and uh, alter uh, 
those predefined filters in case you want to uh, modify it. Um, I don't know if this was uh, something from the City of Bell Gardens. That's why I didn't do a demonstration of Bell Gardens is because since it is such a small community uh, and small uh, parcels, uh, you know, if it doesn't happen to have too many uh, priority growth areas uh, and it's, you know, outside of several constrained areas, um, it can be a little confusing. Um, but uh, it, it's mostly there to kind of showcase, uh, you know, uh, what could, uh, wh where is the most ideal areas to grow in a community. Um, but it's not to say this is the only place. So I hope that was helpful, but yeah. Perfect, thank you. Um, and then we have a question uh, related to uh, some of the uh, new legislation. So for SB 423, is the Coastal Commission required to ministerially approve coastal developments slash um, development permits slash appeals of CDPS. Right. So um, as I, I put a, an answer in the chat and a link to the legislation, I've just taken a quick review. So please um, dig in a little bit deeper yourself. First of all, remember that this is um, applicable only come 2025. And the way I read it, when you look at the end of the legislation, it seems to be for local jurisdictions issuing LCPs only. Um, and then they're subject to several carve outs that I also um, put in the chat. Thank you so much for that, Margaret. Um, we have another question at a uh, statement of question just to clarify under ab 1332 um the jurisdiction will need to hire an architect firm to draft these pre-approved plans to have available for the public that is a great question and i have actually i have been asking that question um also to other jurisdictions my um i do not um know the exact um you know what specific it be that they actually specify you know that to hire but my understanding from other cities they've actually um have passed pre-approved plans um and mostly have been you know going going through a whole process um to how to uh, how to do that and um I so that is um not is it doesn't seem like it's limited to just you know hiring one architect firm it seems like it'd be several different um companies that could offer it but they have to be going through a process to um, approve ADU plans for their local jurisdiction. Right. Thank you so much. Um, so we have one more question in the chat. Um, this was, can you further describe how these tools relate to equitable housing access and the need to, and the need to affirmably further fair housing and housing elements, as this is challenging? would welcome direction on how these tools can connect to AFFH and implementation of housing elements. Um, so our first part of the series uh, focused uh, more on AFFH than today. Um, is that recording up, Bryce, that we can send to the participants again? I think that 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 um, that uh, part one made a, a more clear connection between AFFH and, and tools that can be used. And I think there was a presentation of an AFFH tool from HCD. Yes, yeah, so we can send that out again. We have it. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and I can also really quickly show um, how you can kind of take a look at parcels in certain areas for that specific reason. So uh, and many times with AFFH, you're looking at placing housing uh, in higher opportunity areas. Um, and with the helper tool, uh, you can turn on higher opportunity areas, which include highest resource or high resource. Um, you can also turn on moderate uh, resource or, or wherever you know, you'd like to look. Um, and so say these are all parcels that fall under moderately resourced areas. And so you can start looking at you know, areas potentially in this part of your community uh, that could see some you know newer types of development to put some lower income housing in you know moderate to higher resource areas um and to also touch base back again on one of the comments earlier in questions um you know 
for bell gardens in particular uh, when I did click on the inside priority areas, um, and if you have all of them selected, it's going to show up as, uh, let me see here, uh, let me get these back on. When you have it back as it's uh, generally filtered area, you're going to see that there are, you know, zero sites that fall 100% on this filter, but you can turn off, say you just want to look at, um, Prior, uh, high quality transit areas. This will show you where the parcels located within HQTAs for 2045. So um, sometimes it does take a little playing around to, to find out more information uh, on those sectors. But uh, yeah, just wanted to post it in there for you. Thank you so much, Lyle. Um, Jennifer, I believe we're at time. Um, but if you could quickly pull up uh, my final presentation, I just want to share the, the link for our um, Toolbox Tuesday survey. Um, so here we have a quick two-minute survey uh, to help us improve future Toolbox Tuesday. So if you have a minute or two, please fill it out. Um, you can scan it here. And um, it's also available, I, I believe, on the web website. So we'll be sending out this presentation as well. So you need the QR code later on, um, you'll have it available. But thank you again for joining us for today's Blue Box Tuesday. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David.